to close things off, we've initiated with starting to talk about startup companies, ideas, all sorts of things on how to implement our solution in the matter of concept, right? What are the means and measurements that we can actually leverage? Yeah, we wait a sec, just because of the noise. Okay, all of the means and measurements that we actually need to start thinking about the idea in a matter of fundraising because we are grown people and we actually need money to live. This is really, really important. But after we've kind of like set up the infrastructure in the matter of human resources, what we need with money and people, we need to actually implement technology, right? And this is like the starting point of a lot of like ideas, two or three geeks meeting, trying to solve some kind of problem that they have, or maybe even just do something cool and create something super cool with technology. Long time ago, I stopped being a zealot of technology. Okay, I really like the idea of taking something, solving a problem with any means that I have to solve it. Okay, and because of that, when you ask me if I'm a Java developer, or Python developer, or whatever, I'm none of the above. Basically, I'm a uh, problem solver. You give me a problem, I will solve it with some kind of technology. Technology might be some kind of human API. I'm sending an API call, and somebody in the back end is getting the request and giving it back to me in a matter of minutes. And I'm doing something. Okay, so build it, and it will come. And mostly this talk will be focused in buzzwords. So I really want to do it as much like as interactive as possible for you not to fall asleep. This is one, and uh, for you to actually like get what's happening outside in the industry and what you actually can gain from technology, even if it's cloud big data, etc. Okay, so who are you guys? Okay, and what am I asking is basically how many people here are software developers? Okay, awesome. Uh, Operations people, sysadmins, you know, regular, and DevOps, another buzzword, data scientists. Okay, awesome. Some people raise their hands even three times. That's really awesome. And QA, UX people, designers. A lot of people solve different kind of problems, okay? And why am I asking that? Because technology actually hits us all. And where do you say distributed systems, okay? And talk about like distributed frameworks. A lot of people talk about Hadoop, and Cassandra as a database, and cloud service providers like Google Cloud, Amazon. Maybe even you can like categorize Mongo as a distributed database of some, some kind. But how do we actually define what the term big data is, okay? We can go back to the 3D model. And what do we mean by that? How much data do we have, okay? How many people can actually answer this question? How much data do you have in your own system, platform, organization in general? How much? Something like 500. More than that. Okay, something like 500 gigs. Amazing. It's great that you actually know. Because most people, when I ask this question, any company, any organization, you know what's the first answer that I get? No. A lot. Awesome. Correct. Okay, and when I ask, okay, what does a lot mean? What do they answer? Really a lot. Okay? Because they really don't know. They think that they have a lot, but does 500 gigabytes sound a lot? 10 terabytes? And if I say it derives 10 terabytes per day? That's a lot. Yes, okay. So to quantify that is really, really important to actually define even the beginning if you have some kind of big data problem. But also how fast, the velocity, okay? Because again, the frequency is super, super important. And if I'm getting 100 gigabytes per day or per hour, it's pretty radical. And of course, because the world is changing super fast, then we're getting a very variable data. Variety. What kind of data? 
So we're talking about formats, right? CSV formats, JSONs, how does that arrive via encrypted manners, gRPC maybe, or HTTP. It really, really depends on how am I receiving the data, how am I actually transforming it, and how am I saving that could be like three different things, right? So once you can answer these three questions, that you have a lot, okay, really, really fast, and really variable data, then basically you have a big data problem. But you need to measure all of these. But, okay, we've defined a problem, some kind of problem with big data, but we need tools to actually solve that, okay? How many people come from the world of on-prem? On-prem, on-premises, physical servers, that you're actually like installing new servers, Guys, you're in the military somewhere. Come on. Maybe you're not doing that, but somebody is actually doing that. You know. Okay, awesome. Banks. Okay, a lot of times healthcare. All of these places are still like in some conception that basically on prem is more secure for some reason. Okay? Okay, who knows Google's security key? They are, okay, they are good, okay? Even if I will invest 15 years of my company, I won't get to the, matter, like, the level of security that Google has, okay? So think of it when you're trying to implement some kind of solution and you're talking about security and you're saying, okay, maybe if I keep my server at home, it will be much more secure. Again, if I won't connect it to the internet, it will be secure, okay? So, people tend to go even when they start off their own startup company to the cloud service providers. How many of you know cloud service providers and have worked with them in the past? Some, okay. Raw names. Google. Google. Amazon. What? What? Azure. Microsoft Azure. Okay, for example. But you can suggest different uh, cloud service providers which give you smaller abilities. Okay? And I will okay. present them to you right now. What? Digital version, for example. Okay, Heroku. I will, I will show you some more examples. And why did I say that? What do you actually need? Because these are like the key components that you need to actually implement any solution that you like. Okay, guys, we need compute, right? We need to store the data somewhere. We need storage. Of course, some kind of data infrastructure because we like analytics, right? We like big data. And databases. Of course, there are like one-on-one -on -one saving data that you can actually search afterwards. But the lower level things, we need security, right? We need roles, authentication, authorization, identities. We need network because like bytes move somewhere. And we need to connect to somewhere. And VPCs, load balancers, some things that basically as developers, a lot of times you like kind of ignore because somebody actually did that for me. And you know who does that for us? Cloud. Cloud. Right. Okay. And of course, for all of this fiesto, we need monitors. Because we need to ask the questions about metrics, about things that we need to collect, and we need to answer with numbers. Okay? A lot is not a number. <coughs> so, which ones to go to? Right? We've talked about like the big mouths. We've talked about uh, Google, Amazon. Uh, basically, Amazon is the... Ruler, okay, it's like more than 80% of the market. Why? Because they were first. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because they were first, okay? They are a great platform. I worked at Amazon like more than two and a half years, okay? They have a lot of tools. Practically, if you need anything, probably there is an elastic something, okay? Elastic coffee maker. <laughs> There are so many tools in Amazon that basically you lose yourself when you try to search for something. And a lot of things are intercombined and they like do the same thing with a different name. Okay? And this is one way to go. But what happens if I only need to deploy a web application? What do I do? Go to DigitalOcean. Go to Heroku. Go to, uh, I don't know, even a subset of some cloud service provider and work with that engine. For example, okay, try to take advantage because why? The guy that was sitting here in the beginning, what did he say? In a startup company, what do we need to do? What is the first thing when we're developing technologies? 
idea. Solve a problem. Okay, solve a problem idea, right. Yeah. But iterate. Okay, do small steps. The one thing that we try to do in every startup company is basically develop everything as light as possible. Okay, why? Because what, what was the thing that I said in the beginning? What is the most important thing in a startup company? Idea. Time. <laughs> time sensitive. Okay, this is super important because your time spent is the most important thing. Yours, your founders, your employees, okay? Compute is cheap. Okay, if something is solved by in a matter of money, do that. And because of that, I kind of like separated them to different layers of like the smaller subset of tools that will get you somewhere. But you need to think portable and you need to think, to think how flexible you can be with your own code. Okay, so basically if I'm developing some kind of Node.js application, I can deploy that everywhere, right? Okay? So, as always, we have the consideration of like coding and write. I would like to find that, right? I want to uh, develop a uh, really um, kind of the right kind of code, correct, clean code. You remember these things? <laughs> the, all of the things that you learn in basic training? Okay, when you're starting a startup company, there is the appropriate code, okay? Because if something super, super hacky gets the job done, do that. Don't think about scale in the beginning. Do something that doesn't scale, okay? I, I will like define that, I mean, shock or shock. Okay? <laughs> a human interface. Somebody that gets a notification via email and does something. Why? Because developing the actual like ability will take me two weeks. But what do I want to do? Go to market. Iterate to your go to market. Totally. I totally agree with that. And these kind of iterations, like for for example, reporting. Okay? How many of you are front end developers? Full stack, front end, you know, like develop web applications. Okay, if I want to create some kind of really nice, good looking report, how long will it take me? Long. <laughs> it's not how much data, it's how complex is the screen. This is the real important, like a week at least, right? Like uh, getting the CSS right, getting the HTML, kind of like a It's a perfect cheat. It's a perfect cheat. Yeah, yeah, I know. CSS is the devil, really. I don't get it ever. But the thing is that the point that I'm pointing to, a manual report or even like automatic report that comes to CSV and shows that on Excel, and they have like nice graphs because they spend a lot of time doing that, might do the job, right? And you iterate over that. You and ditch a lot of features. You ditch a lot of like extra information that you would have done. You would have like kind of developed that and added it to the idea and everything, but it's, it would have gone to waste because basically you would have thrown that after two months, right? But when you created that manually, everything just happened, right? So when you start something, a lot of times you think, wait, I want to be like cutting edge. I want to go to the world of microservices, right? Not about it. How many other developing things with microservices architecture? Well, awesome. So eventually what you get to when you develop any product, not only like starting a startup company, even doing some kind of MVP where you're working at, even if it's a huge corporation, you get to a micro. Okay? That means that you get to some kind of like weird mesh of microservices that you can deploy only together. That basically means nothing, okay? And this is eventually what you get to. So how does that look, that specific micro? So a lot of times you have like the physical things, OS, CPU, memory, this. Uh, on top of that, of course, you have the level of processes, uh, databases, web servers, application servers, Java processes, all kind of things. A lot of times you have even load balancers. They might be software, they might be hardware. And you have different kind of user applications that you're running on top of it, some kind of integrations that you might have. Everything usually is on one machine, okay? On like monolith that you're deploying. So eventually when you kind of like dismantle everything to different services or microservices or whatever, and basically you get some kind of 
scheme like that. Okay, we have service A talking with a database, service B talking on top of a cache that is on top of a database. They're both reporting to some kind of queue. Everything is being served to a web server, working with another database, of course, with service C, and talking with some kind of analytics layer. And of course, everything might be not even in one team, right? The responsibility can be shared across the organization, across groups, across even different companies a lot of times. Okay, but if we go back, most products start off with something super simple, right? Nowadays, it's a web front application, right? Talking to some kind of application code back in the back end, working on a single server, and working with some kind of database with maybe images, maybe some kind of things that are served from storage. Okay, awesome. So what kind of storage? How many know these buzzwords? Okay, what is SQL? Uh, Structural equivalent. Query language. So what is NoSQL? Irrational. Server. What? Like irrational, like Mongo. Irrational servers. Okay. So right, these are rational databases a lot of times, but NoSQL is not only SQL. Okay, this is the, the direct terminal, and what that means is that basically a lot of times the databases a lot of times are distributed. Okay, distributed means that they don't have relations between tables, etc. But a lot of times they have query languages pretty similar to SQL. So, which kind of databases do we have? So, uh, I'll take the example of Google Cloud. You have Cloud SQL. And, and have any of you actually worked on these like, platforms? Okay, awesome. Right. Yes. So, I'll, I'll probably elaborate on that. Uh, Cloud SQL basically is something, a managed service that is running or MySQL or Postgres SQL. Okay? And this is a SQL, managed SQL solution that it makes life much easier. You have replication, you have backup, you have storage. You pay a bit more on that, but you get a lot of things. Vertical, like scalability, and, and really it's a regular database that you will be running, but you won't have to have your on-prem DBA. It will still work that way. On-prem DBA to actually manage all of this kind of things. From our side, you have Cloud Spanner. Cloud Spanner is a SQL database that kind of broke the cat figure. Okay? What? Can you repeat what you said? Cloud Spanner is a fully scalable distributed database that does SQL. It broke the cat figure. I will show what's cat figure. Maybe I have it in the next slide. I don't remember. And so I will explain to you afterwards. And the NoSQL landscape is kind of divided to the four main categories. Okay, and you might have worked with these kind of databases in the past. And so the process, graph databases. How many of you have worked with graph databases? Neo4j, maybe, maybe some kind of like inner implementation, awesome. No, Fana. What? No, Fana. Gafana? No, 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 no. No, no, no. no, no, no. no. Graph databases, connections, meaning like you have the model in the back end is like graph. Mathematical graph. Okay? No, no. Not graphical user interface. Key value stores. What? Key value stores like uh, Redis. Uh, a lot of like object storages, document stores, guys, nice mobile, okay? Yeah, mobile. Uh, and Y column stores like HBase, Cassandra, all of the things that have multiple columns, BigQuery also. And the key constraints are the cap here consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And always, you say, choose two out of the three. What Google claims that basically Cloud Spanner in a matter of latency broke that cap. The NoSQL landscape, a lot of times you have out-of-the-box solutions that give you really easy managed services exactly like in the cloud service provider. So cloud data store, okay, it's document-based, indexed, it's giant, it's infinitely scalable, you can put in whatever you like. Okay? Of course, it's not that simple. <laughs> they do some kind of heavy lifting and you have caps that you will arrive to, but you get that as an end service. Cloud Firestore, what happens if you have a mobile application, you're not a back-end developer, all you know is Android, okay? Then basically you can use back-end as a service, okay? And database as a service. And Bigtable, a columnar database, 
mainly based on the HBase API. Uh, again, low latency and uh, cost efficient and scalable, of course, because you don't need to put in like a huge Hadoop infrastructure to support that. Okay, so which one should we use, SQL or NoSQL? Yeah. Yeah. I love this answer. Uh, Depends. I have a good yeah. Multi cloud. Uh, uh, plus yeah. IoT. <laughs> oh no, it's not a cloud. Just kidding. Like, I'm not. I'm not saying that which cloud service provider to use. But which multi cloud? We need to pick the best out of each one. I, I would say not multi cloud. Best of breed. Okay. Okay. Because it doesn't really matter if it's on the cloud or not. Yeah. I'm. I'm just saying choose whatever actually fits you. And you know the answer. This is what I know. Oh, this is another great answer. I know Mongo, okay? It doesn't scale, I don't care, because I really want to build a product right now. Why, again, a lot of consideration were even when I was in the military, yeah, I need to support, like, uh, yeah, some kind of Armageddon's day that uh, all of the world collapsed and blah, 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 blah. Okay, and what will that give me? If something changes, I will change my software accordingly. If you don't know how to change software accordingly, please do this. <laughs> This is my my own idea. Okay, so no, cheaper it really depends. Okay, because if you talk about traffic, cloud is not cheaper in any manner. So it really really depends. Why? How can you know your traffic if you're just now? How can you know how much traffic you have right now, or in general? In general, like I'm starting something right now. Okay. Like if you're starting something right now, do what's most familiar for you. And that's it. Even put a server in your house. I don't care. <coughs> if it makes like, the, the job done, I don't care. Yeah. Think like three, four steps forward and for you to be able to be flexible, but that's it. What if I don't like SQL at all? I don't want it. Like. Awesome! Awesome, right? For your own database. Not Why not? Again, as long as it's flexible for you and it makes like makes you to achieve your goal, awesome. But again, most like 99.9 percent .9 of the times, probably you won't be the best database uh, creator, right? Somebody did that better than me. So why why for me not to reuse that? Right and simple. That might work also. <laughs> Uh, please don't. <laughs> okay, so in general we have a lot of services and a lot of th services that give us out of the box a lot of things when we're using cloud, when we're using managed services, okay? A lot of times I will be using cloud, but someone else's cloud because I'm using a managed Cassandra, Cassandra service. So for example, you can talk about like Cloud Pops Up, which is a queuing service, cloud storage and object storage. A lot of like databases that you have also them as cloud and a lot of compute frameworks that we have. And also, of course, external APIs. How many of you are handling NLP, machine learning, deep learning of some kind, training models on photographs and everything? Okay, how many of you actually think that they did that better than Google? <laughs> Just saying. Again, when you're doing like a million API calls a day, and you have like, I don't know, 150 terabyte of data of photos, and you've trained that model with, I don't know, like data center of 10,000 servers, maybe you will be doing a pretty good job, and you won't be paying as much money as like you would be if you called the, all of these APIs. But again, most other companies in day one are not that. Okay, so you need to take that into account to leverage the APIs, leverage like tools like Watson, like all of these kind of things, basically to get as much value as possible out of these products. And the free Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, this is the Again, so free everything customers. free comes with the cost. <coughs> say, You're the product. Stick it. So, how do I actually scale the system? Containers. Okay, another buzzword, serverless. And what does that actually mean? So what's a container? And we used to work with physical servers, right? They have lots of CPUs, they have resources, they have all of these things. They have an operation system, right? So packaging everything inside some kind of like container, 
<laughs> and a runtime process with components might be even like a really lightweight operation system, right? So containers basically take that advantage of the Linux kernel and uh, do some kind of isolated environment to run some kind of package of code. And uh, let's like see the division of people. And how many are Java developers? Okay, uh, no developers? JavaScript? Python? .NET? You should you should watch Java Zones videos. They're awesome, really. It's a it's a great it's a great conference. Um, okay, so basically, I don't care. Once I put it in a container and I put a REST API on top of it, an HTTP one, that's it. Okay, I can change it to Ruby tomorrow, or I can change it to Python, or whatever actually works for me. So this is a container basically running on top of some kind of OS, but it's not a virtualization framework. Okay, it's taking advantage of two main features, namespaces, okay, and um, namespaces of uh, the Linux kernel, and uh, I forgot the word. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll remember that afterwards. And um, <coughs> right now I'm locked. Okay, so how do I actually run these containers? And basically the company that invented the standard today is Docker. You probably heard of Docker. Okay? And what? Well, you have different formats. You have Rocket also. Okay? You probably won't hear about it much because CoreOS did about that, but it's why you use also. But let's take an example of Docker. Docker would be the runtime engine running these containers on top of some kind of like physical machine or maybe another virtual machine running. And you have different kind of uh, container runners, okay? For example, Kubernetes is the lead one today in the world. Okay, and I'm not just saying that because it's Google, it's because everybody are developing that as an open source and I'll show that in future slides. But you have also like flexible app engine that can run three form Docker containers we need to add something more to that. Okay, so we have app engine as a serverless framework that runs Docker containers. You have like multiple ones also open source. And you have Kubernetes engine that is a managed Kubernetes service on top of Google Cloud. That might work also. You get a lot of things out of the box, monitoring, logging, DNS, service stuff, you know, scaling a lot of things. That as a best practice of developing software, you get it by being ha like having to do this their way. So what is Kubernetes? It's a great help. It's a framework based on a framework at Google, which was called Tor. Right, sorry, I'm covering the screen. And uh, it's 100% open source, written in Go. Google just announced that they're uh, kind of like giving the Cloud Native Foundation, which is supporting Kubernetes, $9 million of Google Cloud credits to actually support the project. They've been taking a step back to give it to back to the community. And IBM, Microsoft, and all of the big corporations are developing things through Kubernetes. Give it up. You gave it back from Kubernetes. Um, uh, actually, we just had a, a, a really cool And they did a pull request on yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah. basic. Yeah. Open shift. Yeah. 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 So you have a lot of integrations also with Kubernetes. So what changed basically when we started running if there's any vegan or vegetarian people yeah. here? I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> about, no no no, no not all you but all I'm about to say. <laughs> In the past, when we had virtual servers, we used to take them as pets, right? They had names, they had a server, I don't know, like every geek has a, a something that they go for a theme and start calling servers at like years or whatever. And they had a unique or a, they are they were rare. Okay, why? Because I knew all of my servers, right? I knew that a server number one or number two or number three kind of like mail function, they need to upgrade it. Personal attention, attention. My server, okay, you to like see where that actually is. And if it gets ill, if it gets ill, you will make it better, right? You will patch it. You will get
get the system means to actually do something with that, update the version and everything. And then we shift it. Okay? We start using them as cap. Okay? And it has a number. Usually it's like a hash number. And one is much like the other. I really don't care. It runs in a, as a group because I like run a fleet of Docker containers on multiple servers. And of course, if it gets ill, I basically make it happen. Okay, I just kill it, and somebody else will like ramp up and use it. Shift in the mindset. And we've talked about community. We've talked about like the development of these kind of tools and all of the large enterprises, small startup companies, the people that actually need abilities developed to the open source of Kubernetes. So, what do we have in the matter of terminology, right? We spoke about best practices that the tool actually makes us develop our software by. So we have deployments, services, replica sets. The most like uh, basic uh, unit of work in Kubernetes is, is a pod. It can run multiple containers on top of it, but most of the times you're running only a single container on a single pod. And you have volumes because we talked about storage, right? How many of you are brave people and running uh, databases on Kubernetes? I'm not brave. Oh, I are brave. Uh, okay. I am still afraid to do that. Usually I run only like staging and development environments because it's easy. And usually I don't need masses to, uh, to actually handle that. Uh, but the cloud service providers are improving. And the integration specifically with GKE and Google is amazing when they're connecting storage. But not everyone are working really well. If you're like developing some kind of offering solution that has volumes with that, you need a pretty good and solid solution, and your software should be written according to like handling failure. Because what happens? Things won't. I, I can't say things might fail because if something might fail, it will fail. Then you have the terminology about labels, selectors, config maps, and secrets. Uh, you know what's the biggest line secrets? They're not secret. A lot of times they're play, kept between play text. Okay, so usually you might want to use some kind of like uh, something like Vault, uh, you know, HashiCorp, or some kind of like different solution to keep your own secrets. But you have things that people usually neglect. And this is like daemon sets, things that are running on a node, a physical node that runs a lot of Docker containers, which is probably a machine that does something, maybe monitoring, maybe a watchdog or some kind. Stateful sets, things that actually attach storage to it and keep it persistent. So if something dies and moves and shifts, the same storage will be connected. Jobs, okay? Everybody are talking about services. What happened to batch operations? We have a shitload of batch operations that we need to run. A lot of big data workloads that are running small machines, machine learning models that are being ran. Batch operations. And we have probes that actually say if a container is live, and if not, what happens? Being killed. And Being killed and another one will start, right? And readiness. Why is there a difference between readiness and liveliness? Because uh, the uh, life, uh, life cell well is uh, already running. The cell well uh, and the cell well that wakes up, it's might take time. Uh, it's done. If a server starts, it might take time to start actually. Okay? But if it's running, then basically it's giving like left hand checks and gives me back. Okay, I'm fine. So, what's about the server mess? You have a lot of frameworks doing servers. The only thing that I want to state here, serverless means that basically somebody is running servers, right? So serverless has servers. And statelessless has state. Okay? So this is not a lie. Somebody is actually doing that, but I like really to like uh, kind of divide it into two groups. When you need to do something super simple, the server is awesome. Okay, maybe check file and that's it. Finish some kind of like one-off operation that you want it to be super scalable and uh, you know leverage the abilities of the cloud of actually handling by traffic. So we have had a lot of traffic right now. I don't need to actually start a lot of. Uh, I'm not, Okay, sorry. I'll go back. If I have a really low uh, load right now, I don't want to hold a lot of servers, right? So I want to grow according to the amount of traffic that I have. But vice versa, if I do something really super complex, 
and I need to add a lot of dependencies, basically I would rather not do servers. Okay? And I, I kind of divide it in my head to if I am doing something more than a couple of seconds, then basically I'd rather not do servers. It's my mantra. Uh, what kind of serverless frameworks do, do we have? So we basically have cloud functions, okay? And the other side, app engine standard, which is the, the minimal things that I need to do to actually launch a web application. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, move forward really, really fast. Okay, we couldn't cover all, but we have a lot of like uh, other kind of APIs basically and the different kind of tools that you can use to leverage off the cloud. <laughs> I won't go into questions. If anybody has questions, we need to kind of like go now. So uh, we can go outside and we can talk a lot about technology. Is that one you And thank you very much for attending.